Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at the intersections of LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for giving us a little bit of your time to better understand this experience. We have a fabulous and excellent episode for you today. As always, I, I know I do say that a, a lot, but today we do. And I'm excited to, uh, to have our guests with us today. If you are watching on a video version of this podcast episode, there is a comment section where you can leave comments um, as the episode unfolds, and we can have a real-time chat with the other uh, audience members who are watching this episode. So, uh, so we invite you to do that. We also invite you just to share your comments. Um, is there something uh, that's being talked about that resonates with you? Do you have a question? Do you have a comment about it? Feel free to leave a, uh, feel free to add your comment into the comment section. And not only will we respond to it, but I think it's cool that each of those people who are watching this uh, video episode will be able to have this uh, interaction. Even after the premiere of the episode, uh, there are still people who have that interaction through the comment section. So we invite you to do that. And if you are watching on the audio version of the, or sorry, listening on the audio version of this podcast through one of our audio podcast players like Stitcher, iTunes, Google, iHeartMedia, or one of the others, we invite you to subscribe to the channel. Those who subscribe through the audio version of the podcast player I do tell you, you will get your audio podcast a little bit sooner than the video version. So that's always exciting for those who uh, subscribe on the audio version. And again, if you haven't yet, please leave us a rating wherever you are listening to uh, this podcast. Now, I want to introduce you to our guest today, which I'm super excited to have. You know him as the naked pastor. Uh, and fortunately for all of us, you're fully clothed. <laughs> David Hayward, welcome to the Latter Gay Stories podcast. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me on the show and hello everybody. Yeah. And so you're all the way down into the studio from uh, Canada, from, That's tr right. from Toronto, Canada. No, I, I'm, I was born in Toronto, but I'm actually much further east. I'm on the far eastern side of Canada. So near St. John, All right, New so Brunswick. Not yeah. so. I, I remember Toronto somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in that story yeah, was Toronto. That's right. But uh, from the far north, you uh, yeah. are here in the Latter Gay Story Studio and yeah. here to share a little bit about your story, which I think is fascinating because you weren't raised Mormon. No. You have no Mormon background. But right. somehow you have been able to penetrate these religious circles mm -hmm. um, yeah. through your art yeah. and also through uh, theology. Yeah which I think is super exciting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I've There's a lot of Mormons and ex-Mormons, ex-Mos, I guess they're nicknamed, who uh, follow my Instagram and, and so on. And uh, it's pretty it's pretty fascinating. I've even had some um, Mormons ask if I could tweak or edit my cartoons a little bit to show a temple instead of a church or whatever. So it's pretty interesting, yeah. So is that in the cards? Are we gonna see a temple show I, up? I have done a couple. Yeah, yeah. I do know the uh, the artist who writes pickles uh, is a Latter Day Saint, and sometimes you will see a temple in the background of the pickles <laughs> episodes, the pickles cartoons. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so that totally useless trivia. Yeah. So David, tell us, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, aside from Canada, yeah. uh, who is David Hayward? David Hayward. Um, I yeah, I was born and raised in Canada mostly. Um, I. Uh, grew up in a religious home, Christian home, and grew up with my father being an artist on the side. He did painting and stuff, so I've always drawn and painted and things like that. But um, I was very, very heavy into Christianity, youth group, ended up going to Bible college from Canada to Springfield, Missouri. And that's where I met my wife, Lisa. It was a Pentecostal Bible college. From there, I went to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Boston, got my master's in New Testament studies, you know, studied Greek, Hebrew, all the original languages. Um, then I went to University of Toronto to start on my PhD in New Testament studies, and we got pregnant. So we took an easy way out and went into the ministry. <laughs> so I was kind of accidentally ended up in the ministry. It's kind of weird. But I served as a pastor uh, for about 30 years and uh, in the Presbyterian Church in Canada, uh, in an independent church, and also in a uh, vineyard church. And so I'd been serving roughly 30 years as a pastor when in 2010 I decided to leave the ministry and put all my efforts into Naked Pastor full time, which had been going on for about five years already. I started the blog in 2005 and uh, it took off. 
And that's what I've been doing full time since, since then. And I want to talk about that Genesis. So yeah. five years prior to you leaving the ministry, right. there was this idea that you wanted to start drawing. Right. Um, what were the, and the drawing is cartoons right. that we've, many of us have seen. Yeah. What were the designs in the beginning? <laughs> what, were the, what were the Genesis designs of your cartoons? They're terrible. <laughs> 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 I look back on my first cartoons and it was like hilarious, you know, me just trying. Uh, it's, it's such, I, I was inspired by other cartoonists. Um, my, my gold standard for a great cartoon is the New Yorker. One frame, very simple, usually black and white often few or no words and so that's what i strive to achieve that kind of quality and and um so when i look back on the early days uh you know it was kind of kind of funny um and kind of you know cringe worthy but i caught on pretty quick and uh people started noticing my cartoons like my blog up until you know 2005 when i started and everything and 2008 or so flew under the radar, but then a couple of my cartoons caught attention and went viral. And then all of a sudden people started noticing my cartoons. My own congregation didn't even read my blog. They're like, we have to listen to you every week. Why should we read your blog? <laughs> so I just, you know, it was kind of cartooning and blogging under the radar, but some of them got noticed. In 2009, I had a profound sort of, uh, Oh, I don't know what to call it. I, it wasn't supernatural or anything. It was just this profound moment where I saw the unity of everything and the oneness of all things and the connectivity of everyone. And um, I started sharing that on my blog and that sort of led to the denomination expressing concern about you know where the direction I was going in and I knew my time was up. And sure enough, a year later, I, I felt compelled to, to leave the ministry and the church. Yeah, and that, that's really what I was interested in too. I wondered the content of your cartoons yeah. in, the, in the early days. Yeah. Um, because today what we see often in a lot of your drawings are um, messages that would probably make traditional pastors cringe a little, yeah, yeah. Um, cringe with self-inflection. Yeah. Uh, also, you draw a lot about deconstruction. Yeah. You, you draw a lot about often your cartoons deal with the um, intersection or the collision between mm -hmm. religion and sexuality, yes. how religion no longer is serving the marginalized communities. Right. Were those the types of cartoons you were drawing five years prior to leaving the ministry or was it more just simple religious based? Um, well, I started to address things that I felt were plaguing the church most and so I, I was cartooning a lot about pro, pro women, um, theology, uh, like the inspiration of scripture and so on, and then um, LGBTQ plus reality and spiritual abuse. And, and so those were probably the big four. And yes, uh, there are a lot of pastors, imams, rabbis, priests, uh, who follow my blog as well, who appreciate my cartoons because they are aware of the systemic kind of abuse that's occurring in the church and in religion generally. And uh, so that's, that's where I think my cartoons sort of caught on was they were addressing a major issue. I wasn't just being nitpicky. I felt I was going after some of the major issues that were... Um, plaguing the church to, to an extent that it was going to cripple it in walking into the future. I think that's a great way of doing it. What, yeah. what motivated you to get there? <laughs> because, I mean, very, yeah. very candidly, mm. you are working as a pastor. Yes. And this is your income. This yes. is your livelihood. Yes. This is your identity. This You're is right. everything. Yeah. And now something leads you to alienate yeah. the very thing that is sustaining you. Well, fortunately, I was in a church that um, uh, I never felt I was, I always gravitated, toward, gravitated towards churches that 
accepted me as a fellow journeyer, <laughs> somebody who was traveling along with them, not as a top-down sort of a, um, you know, guru or preacher or teacher or whatever. I felt we're, we were growing and traveling together. And so the, the last church I pastored when I was really starting to blog really was, you know, we were in the same, on the same kind of a page. And I was talking about this stuff publicly in my sermons and so on about, um, you know, the systemic um, issues of the church and uh, how uh, it's important for us to be our most authentic selves. You see, the, the, I think the driving force for me has always been, I want to be free to be me. And, and so when um, I was constantly encouraging other people, you need to be free to be you. You're free to be you. And I don't even get, have to give you permission. You're just free to be you and your own authentic self. And for me, that included everyone, including my gay or trans friends or whatever. And so um, th I think that's the driving kernel of what I'm about is you are free to be your and express your authentic self. And so everyone who is like, you know, in the closet spiritually or gender wise or sexually or whatever, um, I, I want them to feel safe around me to, to, to be their most authentic self. And that, of course, ran into conflict with the church because it wants, it's really the church and church leaders, my experience and observation, um, wants conformity and compliance. Yeah. And as you're talking about that, the question that keeps popping up in my mind is that that ability to recognize a marginalized community, is that the naked pastor speaking or is that David speaking? Or was there a time where David had to catch up to where the naked pastor was right. at? Was, was there a, a transfer there of, of ideology that allowed you to recognize and, and embrace the marginalized communities? <laughs> You know, it's interesting. It's kind of like um, Naked Pastor. Uh, I, I accidentally fell on the name. I, my first blog was, can you believe it? It was called churchpundit.com. And I didn't like the name. It sounded so pretentious, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I, at that time, Naked Chef, Naked Archaeologist, The Naked Truth, all those were kind of popular at the time. And so I Googled Naked Pastor, and the website was available. And I think I accidentally entered my name into an auction. I didn't even realize. But I got an email saying, congratulations. <laughs> you won the auction for the URL, nakedpastor.com. And I thought, oh, and it says, open to see your invoice. I thought, oh, no, because websites cost thousands of dollars. Anyway, it was 60 bucks. Wow. Nobody else wanted it. <laughs> so I went with it. And... And so it, that was just me, you know, blogging, essentially logging online. It's your online journal. And so that's why I called myself the Naked Pastor. I wanted people to see behind the curtain, to see the real me, a real pastor in the real church with real conflicts, real doubts, real struggles, you know. And um, so that Naked Pastor was really me venting and expressing my truest self. And uh, I think me feeling that kind of freedom to be me, my most authentic self, attracted other people that wanted that same kind of freedom. I'm curious about how your, um, we talked a little bit about how your congregation reacted. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious how your wife reacted to yeah. this immediate turn into, from pastoral care to artists yeah. and envisioning. Yeah. Lisa is uh, a saint, an angel. You know, the fact that she's a hospice care nurse uh, says a lot. Uh, she really is a compassionate person. And we have been madly in love ever since she was 18. I was 20. We got married when she was 19. I was 21. And um, we were joined at the hip all the way through. You but see, then you when should, I left... You should have been Mormon. You were... Brigham Young would have loved that. Young... I know. I love saying I married a teenager. But uh, we were, I mean, madly in love. We still are, even more so. But, I say but, because when I left the ministry in the church, that threw a bomb into the middle of our marriage. My family, our relationships, our finances, you know, my 
sense of purpose and meaning in the world, my destiny. It was, it took a, a few years to recover from that. It was really, really difficult. But we, we, we regained our feet, we found our bearings, we renegotiated how to be married <laughs> again, and we were doing better now than ever. But yeah, it was a real struggle. Was it, was it the loss of income, the loss of, of the routine, or was it your focus on some of the difficult parts of the message, the deconstruction, the, the queer community, the, yeah. uh, the fact that religious communities aren't always accepting and loving and yeah, Christ-like? When, when you grow up in the atmosphere of church, or, you know, temple, uh, what would you call it, temple? Or yeah, church, 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 I think, is su- super adequate for... Yeah, so when you grow up in that, that's the air you breathe. <laughs> and when we left, the, when I left the ministry, I live in a, the kind of a small kind of town that there were no options. I, I, Naked Pastor was kind of infamous already, and uh, I was already infamous as a pastor, and so, uh, you know, there wasn't anywhere we felt free to go. There is one church that we f- felt free to go, but it was like an hour and a half away. But, uh, and we'd go there when we could. But when, when it's the air you breathe and everything, like when you walk into a church or when you're raised in a church, everything is handed to you on a silver platter. Your friendships, you've got mechanics, you've got babysitters, you've got people praying for you, you've got potluck suppers, you've got activities, you've got, you know, and as a pastor, you've got uh, an income, you've got, you know, a plan, you've got a purpose for living, you've got a retirement, all this stuff. But when, when I left the ministry, we lost all our friends. We lost our church. We lost our meaning for living. Like, what do we do now? Um, we had to file for bankruptcy. It was, uh, our kids had left home. They were all adults and they'd all left home. We were empty nesters. Lisa had gone to university to get her nursing degree. It was, it was utter chaos. And it took us a few years, a lot of counseling, a lot of conversation, a lot of heartbreak uh, to, to work things out and renegotiate how to, how to live life again post church. I think uh, there are so many Latter-day Saints who are post-mo or ex-mo who are shaking their heads right now saying, you are speaking my language. I completely understand Uh, because this is such familiar territory for those who leave the church. You literally leave the community. Yeah. Uh, Aside from the the only one thing I disagreed with was pay because Latter-day Saints are um, lay leaders. So there's, there is no pay in uh, Mormon churches for bishops or lower tier um, uh-huh. uh, ecumenical leaders. But aside from that, aside from the actual financial side of it, the loss of community, the, the sense of community that falls away, yep. the babysitters, the ward friends, the neighborhood, <laughs> everybody that's so involved in your life, yeah. they all disappear, they, I, they move on. I compare it to um, like a lot of people who didn't grow up in the church or whatever, they, they don't relate. They don't understand really what you're talking about because they've never experienced that. And so I compare it to, it's kind of like you've got a brain tumor, but it's not just a lump. It's the kind that spreads its tentacles throughout your brain. And it's that kind of surgery that it's, you could die. Like, it's, like there's so many tentacles that reach out into every area of your life, your social life, what you eat when you eat, what you do with your money, what kind of friends you can have, what you do during the weekend or weeknights, um, you know, how you talk, uh, sexuality, everything is affected by your religious upbringing. So when you extricate yourself from that, it's, it really is like, how do I do this? Like you really, it feels like you're starting from scratch. Yeah. Let's talk about that process because yeah. I think you've become the resident expert on deconstruction uh, in faith communities. So let's talk a little bit about deconstruction. Sure. Let, uh, first, what is, when we talk about deconstruction, how would you define deconstruction? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny. I was in 2008, I think it was, I was asked to go to a, a pastor's workshop on uh, like a weekend workshop on hermeneutics, which is how to interpret the text or the Bible. And we were told to read a whole bunch of books beforehand, and they were basically all um, uh, books on hermeneutics. And one of the things that we had to read up on was deconstruction, which is a philosophical theory out of France, Derrida. Derrida um, was the one who invented the word. 
and basically it's you question everything about the text everything and that the, the text you just can't know what the truth is about the text etc anyway that aside i sort of loved the word deconstruction i thought you know everything that they're t i actually walked away from that conference it was supposed to turn me off of deconstruction it actually converted me it turned me on to deconstruction and i thought you know this this is a great word to describe what i'm going through where i'm questioning everything everything i'm questioning and 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 so i just started using the word in 2008 to describe what i was going through some people said you sound like a deconstructionist they meant it as an insult but i took it as a compliment and so basically what it just means is questioning it could be everything from was the earth really created in six days to is there a god like everything is nothing is immune from the being questioned so uh that's what i mean by deconstruction is just questioning everything yeah why is why was it such, why is really deconstruction become a big business why why are so many religious uh institutions organized religion specifically fighting i mean it's almost as if deconstruction is satan itself yeah Th this idea that so many people not just within the latter-day saint faith community but other churches are experiencing mass amounts of deconstruction. Yeah. Well, why, do you, why do you think that is the case? You know, I think I just named something that has always been going on, but we, we, uh, we called it backsliding <laughs> before, where if you question your belief, that wasn't a good thing. I know that because I, that's what I grew up under was if you question your beliefs, that was you being tempted and Satan speaking to you and you rebelling against God and so on. And um, so I think that's something that's always happened. But, you know, when, when people in the past started questioning their beliefs, they were either corrected or silenced or expelled. Those were the three options. You either fixed it or you shut up about it or you left those were the only three options but now um and especially since covid uh people are realizing that they can ask questions and even leave the church without a whole lot of consequences negative consequences and um from the church i mean there are consequences but so uh, i think that's why it's becoming like i've i've seen videos and people say have you seen this where these people talk about deconstruction the demon of deconstruction or it's from satan and you know all this i've been called the mouth of satan myself um just because i'm talking about deconstruction but i think it's becoming normalized and that's what's really scaring a lot of people who are a part of the structure or the system do you see it kind of like a like the gutenberg bible era of <laughs> yeah. of religion where the movable type created the yeah. personal copies of the scriptures and now people, I mean, I've, I've often joked a little bit that it was Google that really was the downfall of Mormonism. People were finally able to start understanding and researching the church's history. Right. They were also able to start connecting the dots in, uh, in specifically to this topic in terms of LGBTQ understanding and messaging in the church. Right. When the Latter-day Saints were able to finally connect uh, the dots and realize that their church leaders haven't always been favorable to yes. the queer community. And when they were able to actually see it in real time via search en engines and the internet, um, I, I kind of wonder, and, and I'm just curious, just opine on in your world, if you, if you see this idea, I think COVID 100% played a role in this, mm -hmm. but if you see things like the internet, deconstruction, all these things as being as monumentous as something like yeah. the Gutenberg Bible, the, the movable type, the Renaissance and revolution mm -hmm. um, periods that we've seen in religion. Yeah, so I, I started talking about deconstruction in 2008. 2010, when I left the ministry, I talked about it more <coughs> to the point where I realized, gee, I'm feeling kind of isolated here. That's the biggest pain point when people leave the church is the loss of community. That's what I notice anyway. And uh, so in 2012, I launched an online community called The Lasting Supper uh, for people who were deconstructing and um, where they'd have a safe place to vent and express themselves. And you know what? People were like, oh my goodness, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. And I think that's what's happened is a lot of people are realizing there's a, l a whole lot of people who are just like me, questioning their beliefs, leaving the church, you know, and um, not believing the lies that they've been told. 
And uh, yeah, it's, it's like the internet has done that for sure. And I've always, I've always said there's only one way to deconstruct and that's your way. And so that's really a rebellious thing to say. But a lot of people are figuring that out. They're like, you know what? I can decide how to be spiritual. And I can decide who to relate with and who to be friends with and who to surround myself with and what to read. Like, I can drive my own car. I can be the captain of my own ship and the master of my own destiny. And it's, it's powerful. It's empowering for individuals to realize that. But it threatens um, everything that's gone on before. I think you're spot on, especially in terms of your analysis of, of COVID. What, what in the COVID area, right. era, what happened really in Mormonism is that people, uh, the Mormon church also shut their chapels and went to an online or Zoom um, format yeah. for a lot of church services. So a lot of Latter-day Saints were no longer mingling with the saints. Right. They were no longer shoulder to shoulder. They weren't fulfilling what we call in Mormonism their callings, their duties and responsibilities within the church. They really were sitting at home, um, partaking of the sacrament sometimes um, as a home duty, right. as a home responsibility, but the church wasn't there. The church wasn't uh, right. entangled in their lives on a weekly or multi-day, multi, multiple days throughout the week basis. And here were these Latter-day Saints who started realizing, look, my life hasn't fallen apart because I, I'm right. not attending church yep. uh, or church services eight or 10 hours a week, which is pretty typical for Mormonism. Yeah. And I think that really started breaking down uh, yeah. a lot of Latter-day Saints where they saw that their world didn't crash when they were no longer giving 125% to the church mm -hmm. and the wheels start turning. So you mentioned something um, as you're talking about the deconstruction and a few times you mentioned the word <laughs> leaving. When somebody deconstructs and leaves a religion, right. where do they go? <laughs> because this is kind of a, we, we hear this from Mormon leaders often about um, if you leave the Mormon church, uh, where will you go? Well, you'll go nowhere um, because there is nowhere else to go. And I, and I think if one thing the Mormon church has done so effectively, it's taught that they are the end all when it comes to truth. Right. That there is no other truth out there <laughs> greater than what the Mormon church will provide you. And so a lot of Latter-day Saints, when they leave Mormonism, they don't go anywhere else. They typically become agnostic or atheist. They just don't find new communities. Now, some do. Some find other pockets because they, they desire that sense of community. They want to still participate in right. religious services. They still want to be able to have a relationship uh, with deity. But I'm curious, in your experience, where yeah. do people go when they leave, when they mm -hmm. deconstruct? What are the typical roadmaps that people follow as they essentially leave the, the chapel pew. <clears throat> so I think there's two kinds of deconstruction. Um, and I, I've talked about this quite a bit, but I, I don't hear a lot of people talking about it. One is theological and the other is ecclesiological. So when you when my my experience and my observation is when people go through an ecclesiological deconstruction, that is when they leave the church, they don't necessarily deconstruct theologically. They could just be like, the church has gone corrupt, it's gone down a bad path, I want to go back to a pure, the, pure origins, you know, and they could even become even more fundamentalist in their beliefs. But people who deconstruct theologically often end up having to leave the church because there isn't a safe space for them to stretch and to grow and to question and to doubt and to come back around and all that kind of thing. I think the church is really great for carrying us through the first few steps of growth. But when we get to that independent phase, like adolescence, uh, the church doesn't know how to handle that, and it drops the ball. Well, what I've seen people do is, um, there, there's a couple of ways to answer this question. One is, some people, yeah, they stop going to church, um, and they figure out other ways to, like they join clubs or whatever. Or they find a church, a pr more progressive church, or a different kind of church. Or um, what I've seen is some people join an online community. I started an online community, The Lasting Supper, and people find their interaction there. The other way to answer that question is, I've had a lot of, I've written a lot about this, is I've watched a lot of documentaries and read a lot about cults, and when people leave cults, almost all of them 
are they're in tears because they miss the intensity of community that they had. Even though they were being horribly abused, they missed that intensity of community. So I started thinking to myself, why is it the communities where I felt the most intense fellowship and community and intimacy were also the places where I experienced the most abuse? Like, that's a serious question. So a lot of people are starting to think, you know what? I've, I've left the church. I do miss that community, but was it normal? Was it healthy? And they are figuring out new ways to form relationships. They're figuring out um, how to make friends. One of the things I realized was I was in the church, and I, my friends were assigned to me, basically. I, and even Bible college, seminary, uh, I had to learn, Lisa and I had to learn in our 50s how to make friends and how to keep friends. And we worked hard at it. Um, also because we've read a lot where the, lo- the people who live the longest have a good social network around them. So we thought, honey, we, we want to live longer. We got to make some friends here. So we, we just started contacting people that we once knew or lost contact with and reconciled with some couples and so on. And we have a little group of friends now that we can get together with. It's hard work, but it does work. And so that's what Lisa and I have done. I think this is a great uh, door to open up in terms of giving some hope to those who are deconstructing and those mm. who who are on both sides of that deconstructive path, those who stay right. in church and right. also those who, who do pack up and leave. Um, in your experience, because you've been able to deal with um, thousands of stories um, and be able to interact, I shouldn't say deal, you've been able to interact with thousands of different experiences. Mm. Is there happiness, joy, spiritual experiences, growth on the other side of that aisle? Unequivocally, yes. Absolutely, yes. I mean, life is life. Uh, Life is hard. But what I've seen is the people who deconstruct and keep going, they don't retreat back or they don't jump into something else real quick where they'll end up having to deconstruct from anyway. People who keep going in their deconstruction they're questioning, which I think is a lifestyle, a way of life, um, questioning everything always. Uh, we, we should be always questioning things, like what the media is giving us or what other people are giving us or culture or whatever, ads, billboards, television, movies, anything. We, we should always be questioning everything all the time. So deconstruction for me is a way of life. Once you sign up for deconstruction, uh, it's for life until you die. And what I've discovered is I've never been happier. I feel more free than ever. My relationships are, are more solid uh, and trustworthy and more diverse. And so for me, the beauty of diversity in my friendships and relationships, you know, me hanging out with Mormons, LGBTQ Mormons is pretty cool you know, today. So, uh, you know, that's just an example. And I've seen that in so many people who are deconstructing is they're a lot happier. They feel more free than ever. They're working at establishing or building relationships and nurturing relationships. And, you know, they're, they're free of the fear and the guilt and the shame that they always lived under. I want to talk about, I, I'm a great segue into the LGBTQ community. Mm. I want to talk about your experience with the LGBTQ community because so many of your cartoons mm. um, surround this topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. My first question is why? Why the LGBTQ community? Why the marginalized queer community? As soon as the church says uh, this far no further, then that, that indicates to me that there's a problem. Um, that, that, you know, they've the church is be, become exclusive. And, and so it seems to me that this is the hill the church is wanting to die on right now. And so that's why I'm fighting so hard. A lot of people think I'm an enemy of the church. Rather, I'm not. I'm, I'm a, I, I hope I'm a friend of the church. Uh, I love the church. The church is like my mother from which I came. Um, but uh, I think it has a lot of issues. I think the church was created... Um, to serve us, 
not for us to serve it. And I keep challenging it to live up to its mandate to serve us and to serve everyone indiscriminately. And so way back in 2007 or 8, when I drew my first, what is called my first gay cartoon, <laughs> um, it was when I had an experience where I'd, I'd, I had gay friends, I had, I had trans friends, but I was in the ministry and I was in a rather conservative evangelical congregation. But I, I didn't have to, for me, there was no um, uh, conflict with me as a person. But I knew there was conflict between them and the institution, the system. But I somehow, we could fly under the radar until I started drawing those darn cartoons and the words started getting out and I was forced to make a decision. And I was glad I left when I did because a couple of years later, a few years later, the um, church that I was a part of, that denomination, um, actually voted to not be affirming. So I left at the right time. Describe to us that first cartoon, this first sure. queer cartoon. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely cartoon. I love it. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and I love it a lot, too, because it sort of put Naked Pastor on the map a little bit. But it shows Jesus walking hand in hand with another man. And the man says to Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus, but I think I'm gay. And Jesus says, relax, dude. I knew that long before you did. <laughs> so it's, it's just very poignant and, you know, very touching and moving. And what I love about it is uh, it makes visible what I believe is true ideologically. Like, I believe it's true, that that's true, that it's, it's about love and acceptance and affirmation, non-judgmental, no fear, no guilt, no shame, no repentance, no forgiveness. It's all, it's just love. And so that's what I believe is true. And I drew it, which is why it's so encouraging to so many people and why it's so infuriating to so many people. Was it encouraging because it spoke to the families of the marginalized community? Uh, or was it, was it encouraging to see that someone from um, the ecclesiastical realm, the pastoral side mm -hmm. of their church, was actually discussing this topic? Uh, to be honest, I think both goes on. But the people I hear from mostly is that, you know, that's my kind of Jesus. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the response I mostly get is when someone sees a cartoon like that, they just feel affirmed, validated, that they're okay, they're not crazy, they're not sinful, they're all, they're all right. And um, sometimes, though, I do hear people saying, I wish you were my pastor, or I wish the church would listen to your cartoons, or whatever, things like that. But I just love hearing the individual stories from people about how they feel my cartoons have actually healed them from living under condemnation. Yeah, I think this is fascinating territory because mm. I often, I'm often in this space as well where the, the lay Latter-day Saint, um, the, the typical Latter-day Saint, I call them pray, pay, and obey members, th those who, who just want to do good, yeah. um, who very often have a queer child or know someone really mm -hmm. close to them uh, who is LGBTQ, and they get it. They, they see over the kitchen table a real human being that they love and yeah. they see the quirkiness, they see the intricacies, they see the beauty, they right. see the connection. Yeah. And, and I think not just in Mormonism, but that is true in many denominations, if not all denominations. Yeah, yeah. But then I think the disconnect comes when the church leader doesn't see that, right. that the church leader is disconnected from that reality and where the leaders of these religions aren't seeing their members in the fullest measure of their creation. Right. And so I can see why, I can see why the cartoons resonate well with the member mm -hmm. as opposed to the patriarchy who seems to fight against it. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good pastors out there, affirming pastors who are part of denominations that aren't affirming. They're working so hard to change the ship's direction and uh, I admire them so much and I have so much empathy for them. 
because I was one of those who graduated from seminary and went into the ministry wanting to be part of, uh, you know, as the Presbyterians would say, the church is reformed and always reforming. And I, part of, I wanted to be a part of that reforming movement in the church. Um, but I, I came to a point where I could no longer do that from the inside, from inside the system. Now, though, I feel like I have more influence than I did when I was inside. I, I'm still, <laughs> I think I frustrate so many people because I'm still in the game, but I don't, I'm not wearing the jersey or something. I don't know what's going on, but I'm still involved, still in the game, still playing, still scoring, but I'm not on a, on a team anywhere. I'm on the marginalized team and uh, who aren't allowed on the field, but yet we're still winning. You know, that's, it's kind of a weird analogy, but that's what it feels like. It's got to be frustrating to church leaders. It's yeah. got to be, it's gotta be frustrating to those who are still uh, within the cloth yeah. that see that type of atmosphere and say, no, 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 no. We're the ones that are supposed to have the following. Why, why are you, why are you, David, yeah. leading our people away? Yeah. Um, yeah, I get that a lot. I just got that today that I'm leading people astray and misleading people and leading people away from the Lord. But I just read this uh, on my way here in, on the airplane. I picked up uh, GQ magazine, which I frequent now and then. And uh, this month, they're, they are featuring AOC um, and uh, her being in politics and everything and the sexism and the misogyny and the patriarchal system that she's encountering on a daily basis. And she, but yet she speaks with such hope and energy and, and power and vision. And it kind of feels like that where, you know, she's maligned and insulted and attacked and everything on a daily basis, even from her own party, the Democratic Party. But um, she's getting things done. And, and, it's, and it's like she says, you know, the future world is here. It's, it's small and it's here and there scattered, but it's definitely here and it's growing. And that's what it feels like. It's kind of like Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream, where it's a dream, but it's becoming a reality. And I want to be a part of that movement. What other, I'm curious, what other um, queer cartoons you've drawn yep. have made waves and have been popular because as an artist and behind the scenes you're able to see the uh the analytics um what other what other cartoons have have made a difference and have have resonated well with the community um well i i've got so many um one that i i drew that uh is, is shows Jesus protecting a sheep while people are throwing stones at the sheep, but Jesus has his hand up, and the stones are bouncing off his hand. Um, another one is where Jesus is just lying in the grass with a rainbow sheep, and um, the rainbow sheep says, thanks for being my friend, and Jesus says, no, thank you for being my friend. Or the one where um, a rainbow sheep is, wants to come into a church and Jesus is with the sheep, <clears throat> and the sheep inside the church that are all white leader sheep says, sorry, but you're not welcome here. And the next frame shows Jesus walking away with the sheep, and the white sheep are going, where'd Jesus go? That one really upset a lot of people, because it, it's, what it's saying is, Jesus is with the marginalized. The Spirit of Christ is with the marginalized. And if you don't welcome the marginalized, you're not welcoming the Spirit of Christ. That's really what it's saying. So actually, the ones who think they're in are out, and the ones who are said to be out are actually in. And the first shall be the last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the last shall be the first. That's right. <laughs> Interesting how that ties together. Are there any cartoons? I've, I'm always curious. Uh -huh. Are there any cartoons with special meanings? Meanings that um, as you drew them, uh, there was something behind it that wasn't obvious in the text or wasn't obvious in the drawing? Oh, there's that always happens. Um, you know, I, uh, I hear from people all the time who are, you know, saying, did you notice that? Or did you do this on purpose? Or, or things like that. But uh, I... I I really try hard to be, um, I don't want to just, I don't want to be cynical or negative or just be attacking. I want it to be 
poignant. So, so for example, one cartoon, it shows a bunch of sheep trying to look in the windows of a church, and they're all on each other's shoulder. They're all rainbow sheep. And they're looking in the window, and one says, oh, he's saying God loves us. Yes, that's good, right? And then the next one says, oh, wait a minute, he said but. <laughs> or another one where uh, there's a guy on, the t- on an operating table, and he has a, a protest sign, and it says, God loves you, but. And uh, there's a God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit standing there, um, and they're going to operate. And God says, we're going to have to remove your butt. So they're going to take the butt off the sign. So things like that, you know, I, I tried to do those double entendres and, you know, double meanings and try to be funny and cute, but at the same time deliver a message with clout. The message. Yep. The queer community. Mm. Their interactions with you. Mm-hmm. Um, now you've been at this for 15, 17 years. 17 years, yeah. Uh, what have you heard from the queer community in regards to your art? I, I get a lot of, uh, tons of, tons of encouragement. I, I really do. It's just overwhelming. And uh, I've, I've got queer friends all over the world in every country. And some are living in daily fear for their lives because some of the countries they're in, are, it's illegal, you know. Um, torture death penalty illegal and uh, it's just I'm, I'm amazed by the camaraderie the love the friendship the grace the compassion the appreciation the gratitude it's 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 really overwhelming um, there there are some people I hear some negative sometime where um, people are triggered by uh, Jesus showing any kind of favor towards a queer person or a, a rainbow sheep or something because that's not the Jesus they grew up with. So it's very triggering for them to, to, to see a false Jesus to them. And um, it can evoke anger in some people um, because they're, uh, they're, they're, they're Je- the Jesus they have in their minds is condemnatory and judgmental and wrathful and exclusive. That's their experience of Jesus. And so I do hear from them, and I feel for them. I have a lot of empathy for them, and I don't know what to do about that. Um, They'd rather I not draw. Uh, I suggest they block me. Um, I don't know what to do about that, but but I can totally empathize with the, the pain they must feel. My... When I was in the ministry, like I, I said earlier, I had gay, trans, bi, etc. friends. And so for me, it was all kind of under the radar. It didn't run into conflict with me personally. I knew it was in conflict with the general popular opinion out there in religious circles. So, But it never came to a point where I had to do anything about that. They could. I had a gay friend, can I come to your church? Sure, absolutely, come to my church. Yeah, totally welcome, 100%. I knew we were in trouble, though, when my lesbian friend came with her girlfriend, and they held hands. I knew, oh, here we go. <laughs> Fasten my seatbelt. Now I got to deal with it, right? So it was that, it was that point where um, we started having to talk about it, and when it, when it become When the queer person become visible. That's exactly right. It's okay to be queer. It's okay to have right. those feelings, but keep them hidden. Yeah. Stay in the closet. Don't show affection. No public dis- displays of affection. Right. And then you'll be just fine. Right. I didn't have a problem with them holding hands. I knew, though, it was going to cause a problem. But I'd, I'd left the ministry before a couple times. I'd been fired once. I'd, been, I'd left a couple times. I, I was ready to do it again. And sure enough, when 2010 came around, I knew um, it, my time had come for me to, to leave. Well, my advice to pastors are, if you can stay in the system and keep working towards turning that ship that can take a long time to change direction uh, to, to become more affirming, then, and you can do that without killing yourself, do it. But if you feel um, you're, you're no, um, you know, 
uh, draining the swamp when you're up to your ass and alligators, as they say. Uh, you know, uh, there are other things you can do and maybe more effective ways you can do your work. But uh, my, my way, I was fortunate. I'd already been building Naked Pasture, doing my art and everything. I, I jumped into that. It took a few years to get it going full time, but that's what I'm doing now. So that's my advice. If you can stay, stay. If you can't stay, figure out a way to do the good work without the professional status. Yeah. My advice often to Mormons in this um, situation, some of the healthiest deconstruction that I've seen uh, in terms of Mormonism is separating the gospel of Jesus Christ from Mormonism, right. from the organized man-made portions of religion right and and allow them still to grasp on the general principles the the very basic principles of of the gospel right which really simply is love right and love each other yeah which has really been something that's been important to the lgbtq community mm. what is your advice to the lgbtq community coming from someone who has been um on the pastoral side of of religion someone who has walked away from that, someone who has recognized the queer community, when it comes to still embracing um, a faith and still re embracing um, an identity as a son, daughter, or child of God, what is your advice from your pew mm -hmm. to the queer community? So my number one advice is always um, keep yourself safe. That's my always number one. Uh, like, if you if you don't feel safe coming out or feel safe where you are, just make all the necessary steps that you can take to keep yourself safe. That's number one. <clears throat> number two is take steps that where you can come out or where you can be your total free, authentic self. Uh, create an environment where you will be safe. So it's kind of like... Um, Many ab uh, abused wives I know who um, they wait until their husband's gone. They've already set up s steps. They've got hidden money. They've got a suitcase packed. They've got friends' phone numbers. They've got a place they can go stay. Uh, everything is set up. And that they've got a whole new life planned. Um, and, and then they take that necessary step that takes a lot of courage to start a new life. Um, so that basically it's the same for my gay friends and so on is do it safe, have a plan and then come out at your own pace. Um, there's nobody's got a gun to your head to do it at a certain speed, like just do it in your own way and then like create your world, create your world, the kind of world you want, get the friends you want, get the community you want, find a community online that you want, read what you want to create that kind of a new world for yourself where you feel normal, that you're okay, and that you're loved, and that you're protected and supported. Beautiful. I love yeah. it. Along that same thread, uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking of the parents of mm. queer kids mm. or, or adults who come out. Um, and I'm sure you've had interactions with those types of family members, mm -hmm. uh, specific parents, specifically parents who come to you or to um, other influential people with a white flag saying, my child has come out, it's all over. What is your advice to that mother or father whose son or daughter or child has just come out to them as queer or trans, bisexual, any? any? Yeah, when our kids were young, Lisa and I, made an agreement uh, like they were coming up to their teen years <laughs> and we knew intuitively that we're in for trouble and so we we made a decision and we were surrounded by religious parents you know other religious parents with their own kids and stuff and we saw what could happen that oh, there's a lot of parenting by fear fear fear-based parenting and lisa and i decided that we were going to nurture our relationship over being right all the time. It was more important to stay in relationship with our kids than to be right or for them to obey our wishes or to fulfill our fantasies or meet our expectations. 
I'll tell you, the teen years that we went through was many years because they're like five, all three of them are like five years apart. It was a long time that we went through of really a lot of chaos. But you know what? They're our best friends now. They're our best friends because they're totally independent. They're totally individual, totally unique, totally themselves, free to be themselves and to express themselves. They're, they're incredible human beings, and we have a good relationship with them. And it's the same with um, parents of queer kids, trans kids or whatever. If, they, if you make a plan, it's more important for me to be in relationship with my kid than to be right or for them to fulfill some kind of a ideological, you know, law book or whatever. Uh, it's more important that my art, we love each other. That's how it works. That's just how it works. And it's, it's better. It's a better way to live. It's a better way to be happy. It's a better way to have a family. It's a better way to have love. Um, it's, it works right down to our spouses. If we, I'm going to love her or I'm going to love him however she manifests because I'm in love with their core authentic self and I'm going to be, I'm going to stand back and awe and wonder as she unfolds or as he unfolds. Um, that's how love works and that includes in parenting too. Beautiful. I'm curious if there are any regrets. You've had a 180 degree turn from what your life looked like 17 years ago. Any regrets? Um, I can't say I do have any regrets. Um, now, I want to I want to I want to clarify something. Um, I, I have made a 180 degree turn in one way, but in another way, I see my life as a trajectory. Like it's a I've been going in this direction. Um, I used to think of growth as linear, but that gave the impression we left things behind or it was all history and behind us. Then I thought maybe it's stage where we go through stages of growth. But then that gave the impression that you look down on your former self and sort of as inferior, less than, below us. And now I think of growth as spatial, where we, we grow outward to include everything that's come before. So I was born and baptized Anglican. I went to every church. I call myself my own ecumenical movement because I've been to so many churches. It was Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Independent, Vineyard, done some crazy things, experienced some crazy things, believed crazy things. But it's, I wouldn't be who I am now unless I was who I was then. It's all sort of like compost folded in to make the very rich, nutritious soil out of which I express myself. And so that's the way I see like Mormons who are coming out of Mormonism. Don't, I say, don't reject anything. Just, it all gets folded in like manure and dirt. It makes compost. It's the bad stuff and the good stuff. When together, it can make a real nutritious soil out of which we grow. So my past, your past, as weird and variegated and diverse as it is, it all somehow folds together to make us who we are today. I love that analogy. Yeah. I really like that analogy. <laughs> um, because it, I think it, I mean, it resonates so well. That is a, a really excellent descriptor of so many people's experiences. Yeah. And as it should be, we, mm. we shouldn't have to wallow in the mire for the rest of our lives. We should be able to uh, literally bloom where we're planted. And, yeah. and we're planted in those areas that are full of our history. That's right. Like, it, who here is embarrassed that they believed in Santa when they were a child? I am not embarrassed. I believed some crazy things when I was a kid. But you know, it, it makes me who I am today. Who knows how that, all that belief in Santa contributed to my feelings of generosity or surprise or wonder or, you know, gift giving or, you know, magic or whatever. Um, and so, you know, with my Pentecostal past and my Presbyterian reform past and my Anglican past and, you know, mystical past and new age past and all this stuff. These are all streams that formed into one river who's called David Hayward right now. 
and I'm still changing right before your eyes, right? So it, that's just the nature of personal growth. Let's talk about the future. What does the future look like for the naked pastor? Mm. We know a little bit about what the future looks like for David. Yeah. Well, well, where's the future for the naked pastor? What's up? What's coming up? What do we? What should we expect? Well, I just came out with a new book, so uh, flip it like this, and it's my best of cartoons. So um, I was forced to melt. 4,000 plus cartoons down into 125 <laughs> cartoons for my best stuff book. So you can get that anywhere books are sold, Amazon, um, uh, Indie Books, Barnes and Noble. But it would be great if you pick one of those up. But that, that just came out in July. But yeah, more writing. I want to write more about deconstruction. I want to defend um, and normalize deconstruction for more people. I want to be on the front lines of fighting for... Um, the normalizing of the LGBTQ community within the human race and within religion and the church and, and so on. And uh, yeah, that's, I, I'm going to keep doing what I do until I die. Uh, your website, where can, where can our listeners find more of your cartoons and more of your products? Yeah. Because you have mugs and t-shirts. Yeah, I, and I have a ton. I sell my stuff. prints and I, I also am a painter. I do watercolor landscapes and other stuff. So uh, nakedpastor.com. That's home base. My most active community, I would say, is Instagram, Naked Pastor. Um, it's very busy, 115,000 followers, and I, I work very hard at keeping that a safe place. Was there anything we haven't talked about in this episode that you wanted to talk about, things that maybe we should have clarified, touched on? My sex life, but I'll, we'll keep that to myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's a separate podcast for that, right? Yeah. No, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, my, Lisa and I have been married now 42 years, wow, and never been happier. We de deconstructed together um, and side by side. I, I actually wrote a book about it, Till Doubt Do Us Part, When Changing Beliefs Change Your Marriage, and um, it's helped a lot of people too. But uh, And our three kids, uh, I love what I do. I love being involved. A lot of people saying, hey, you left the church, why don't you just leave us alone? Or, you know, why aren't you gone yet? Um, it's because I feel I'm in that margin between people who are in the church and people who are outside, but who still want to integrate everything together, including their religious past. So I want to continue working to help people make sense of that in healthy ways. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's, this has been an excellent episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, a little bit of your background, your story. Uh, but personally, thank you for opening the world to a topic that is unfamiliar to them, mm. specifically that of the, the queer community. Mm. Thank you for shining light and, and giving visibility to this topic where so many other church leaders um, not just would, but have passed this community by. Yeah. Um, mainly because of its small in number. But I can't help but think, like, if we're talking about religion, we're talking about the 90 and 9 and leaving the 90 and 9 to find the one. Mm -hmm. And just as a personal thank you, I want to say thank you for finding the one. Thank you for yeah. drawing and bringing attention yeah. uh, to the one. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm humbled. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. We are, uh, we're thrilled to have David Hayward here on the podcast. So uh, thank you again for, yes. for sharing your story. If there was something in, in this episode that resonated well with you and you want to connect with David, uh, as he talked about, the Instagram is there. Um, also his website, nakedpastor.com. Uh, and the very, uh, you'll see we share uh, his cartoons frequently, but they're all over the interwebs. Uh, you definitely will, just a simple Google search will find them as well. So I invite you, I encourage you uh, to seek out more of, of those cartoons and support David as he continues to support um, the LGBTQ community. And again, we want to thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection of sexuality and religion um, and to hear another story and, and draw a little closer to the the LGBTQ community. Again, if you are watching this on a video episode, we invite you to share this episode. We are uh, broadcasting this episode on YouTube and our Facebook channel. It's also available online at LatterGayStories.org. If you are listening to an audio version of this episode, wherever you catch your favorite audio podcasts, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and also give us a rating. By doing those two things, it does help expand our reach and uh, it allows us to 
build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community, essentially by creating more visibility. So for those of you that are, that are sharing our episodes, that are commenting on our episodes, that are interacting with our episodes, I say thank you, because that is one of the greatest things that helps this podcast and our reach. Again, we want to thank you for sharing um, a little bit of your time today. Again, uh, one last thanks to David uh, for him coming into the studio and being so candid and open with, uh, with his vision of what the, the world, especially the religious world, should look like. Again, thank you. Subscribe, share, like, and continue to be the good people that you are to the LGBTQ community. It's stories like yours, it's stories like mine, and it's stories like David's that help us each to continue writing our own latter gay story.